dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. It might surprise many of us to remember that the saints themselves were oftentimes leaders and as such had to shoulder the heavy burden of leadership just like we do. It can be helpful to learn from them. What did they do? How did they handle the daily stresses of life? In this first class of leadership lessons from the saints, I look at John the 23rd's 10 rules for a day, rules that he practiced every day and which certainly could help us as well. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. I'm glad to be with you again, and I want to take you a little bit deeper today in understanding some of the spiritual lessons from the saints. For most of us, we know saints as ideal figures, right, who taught about spirituality and loved God very much, maybe had some hard times to go through, and who in the end are are the objects of our veneration and devotion because they live the Christian life in a spectacular way. And we all owe them that. Well, that's it's beautiful. Whether you think that you should pray to saints or not, uh, they are a part of our tradition. And, and they're a beautiful part of tradition. St. Paul saying, for example, that Christians shine like the stars in the sky. Uh, amidst a wicked and depraved generation, right? So that's for all of us called to be saints like stars, these models that are out there. But for most people, that's all that they are. And because they live in this ideal world in our minds that we make for them, we can miss the opportunity to really learn from their example. Because for, for most of us, we see the saints as living a life that's, that's not relative to ours, that's something that's distant, that we can't really grasp or, or, or relate to. And yet, in fact, the saints lived in times very much like our own and with situations and confrontations to make just like the ones we have today. I mean, maybe some of the circumstances are a little bit different. But in essence, they had to do the very same things that we have to do today. We have to strive for God, find him in the midst of busyness, confusion, a a lot of, of contradictions, persecution, opposition, the daily stress, for example, of our life. Even St. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, right in the Bible, he actually mentions that at the very end of his long list of sufferings, of things that he's had to go through for Christ, which entailed shipwrecks and entailed uh, imprisonment, entailed persecutions, entailed riots, all these terrible things. But he puts it the last thing, my daily anxiety for the churches, meaning that he had to carry the weight of leadership on top of everything else. As he says, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? Meaning he has to take care of all of the people of God in the churches that he founded. So you can almost imagine, like, how did he balance his day? What was St. Paul's work-life balance like, right? Uh, how did St. Paul deal with, with the failures that he would make or, or the mistakes that he made along the way? What was his attitude like when he went to bed? Or when he got up in the morning, how, how did he keep his positive energy going? I mean, when, when you look at the life of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, for example, she, she was founding houses and founding a religious order with two to 3,000 sisters in it. She had to build a structure. She had all kinds of governmental decisions to make. She had to appoint sisters to various posts, discipline sisters, solve for recruiting issues, and let alone all of the political situation of founding houses in foreign countries, traveling constantly, trying to put her organization, her order on solid foundations. And the whole time she was doing that, she wasn't sure that she was loved by God. She didn't have a feeling that she was loved by God. She was sure in faith, but she was left in this terrible dark night. Uh, St. Damien of Molokai, who went out onto the island of Molokai in the Hawaiian islands and built a leprosorium to help people with leprosy 
Uh, he, he went on to build not only a presorium, but he built a hospital that where they could take the latest uh, medicinal remedies for leprosy. He had to start a cattle ranch to feed them, teach them how to farm, teach them how to start a band, for example, to celebrate the moments of the community uh, while he was running a church. And that whole time trying to pray all while being utterly alone. And, and surrounded by the worst situations possible with very little support. So how did he do it? What was his psychology like, right? How did these people who did these incredible things do them? Like in, in the nitty gritty, did they feel like us? Did they, did they struggle like we do? I mean, a lot of people think that they didn't. It, when you really, you know, how close are you to allowing the weaknesses of the saints to help inspire you to be strong, right? Like most people don't want to think like that. They, we make this saints so perfect that it's impossible for us to really imitate them. But in point of fact, when you look closely at their lives, many of them were, were turned kind of upside down by the circumstances of their, of their lives. Not all of them did the right thing, made all the right decisions. Sometimes they were overwhelmed. Sometimes they were at the, at the verge of stopping. How did they keep going? How did they persevere on their pathway to holiness when being crushed by so many obstacles from a very practical world, uh, uh, from lawsuits to economic conditions that were not favorable to people who were opposing them along their way? The, the saints had to deal with all of the realism that we had to deal with. And, and I want to look at that with you because they're going to teach us not only about holiness in, in spirituality and in prayer, but also holiness in how to live every single day amidst the grind and the vicissitude that we have to deal with constantly. I think there's so many Christians today who feel like, you know what, I have not, I, God can't be really using me because you think that the spiritual life of a Christian is supposed to be easy. You think it's supposed to be smooth and joyful. And, and so when it's not, you say, I must be doing something wrong. And therefore, I'm going to keep God out of all of those areas of my life where he's eminently practical and, and where life is challenging and therefore where he's most needed. And that doesn't make any sense. We need instead to develop a sense of our spirituality that allows us to see in the challenges of life, the occasions where we meet Christ and to learn from the lessons of the saints. And so I want to do this in a special way with starting with John the 23rd. John the 23rd was a Catholic Pope, right? He was a Pope in the, in the late fifties, early sixties. He was the Pope who famously began the second Vatican council. Uh, and he's a saint. He wrote a, a biography. He said that an autobiography of sorts of his soul called the journal of a soul. And in that book, which is rather long, he said, my soul is in those pages. Okay, so he wrote down for us how he approached every day. And you see a man who has many weaknesses. Uh, now, I'm not talking about faults or failings. I'm talking about weaknesses, a proclivity to not lead. A lot of anxiety, for example. There's a, a funny story about him where upon being elected pope, he couldn't sleep because he just felt the full weight of the responsibilities of his office. And, and so the, uh, supposedly one night he, he fell into a kind of dream. And he had a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus told him, good Pope John, whose church is this anyway? And John the 23rd responded in the dream, well, it's your church, Lord. And then Jesus told him, well, then why don't you let me take care of it? And ever since then, he said he slept sound through the night. And yet for all of his weaknesses, he also leaves for us 10 rules that he tried to follow every day. I'm going to present them here to you as rules that we could try to implement as well. A lesson from a saint. How did he do it practically? He woke up in the morning and he read through these rules and tried to put them into practice every day. Sounds like a great plan to me. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. All right, so we're going to look together then at the daily rules that Pope John the 23rd tried to follow as a leader, as a Christian in leadership. That, and that to which he you know, gives the credit for any of the holiness that he achieved. So we have this model example of a Christian, but it didn't come automatic. 
It came through deliberate practice of these rules that he wrote for himself. According to you know what he puts in the journal, every morning when he would wake up, he would read through these and then try to focus in on them. Okay, so what are they? First rule, this is a great one. Only for today, I will seek to live the live long day positively without wishing to solve the problems of my life all at once. <laughs> what a great rule. To live this day positively without trying to solve all the problems of my life all at once. Isn't that amazing? Because we got to remember in leadership that problems are our playing field. We, we exist to lead in order to solve problems. But that, that's kind of a challenging perspective. And how amazing to see John, John 23rd beginning the day saying, no, I'm not going to solve all the problems. I'm going to stay positive this day. I think it's such a profound lesson for us of just practical wisdom and leadership. In other words, we have to almost be outside of the battle in order to win it. If you're constantly fighting the, the battles of the day, well, in, in, in its true sense, you may have already lost them. I mean, practically put, if you're fighting all the time, well, then you're not leading. We have to solve things, but we can solve them all the better when we start from a position of positivity. Something almost like to say, I'm over and above all this, and I just go into my day in order to do all the good that I can. But I know that at the end of the day, there's still going to be other problems that are left, and I'll deal with them tomorrow. Pacing our negativity out can help us to, to champion the cause of true positivity and also to enjoy our day a lot more. Second rule, only for today, I will take the greatest care of my appearance. I will dress modestly. I will not raise my voice. I will be courteous in my behavior. I will not criticize anyone. I will not claim to improve or discipline anyone except myself. I think it's very interesting that the very second thing, he starts off by saying, I'm going to live this day positively. And then the next thing that he says is, I'm going to make sure that I treat others well. Now he focuses on that by speaking of his appearance, right? But right after that, he talks about the way that his, his attitude appears. I will be courteous. I will not raise my voice. I will not criticize anyone. These are things, if you notice when you put those in there, it means that that's what you're tempted to do. Right? They're tempted to raising your voice, tempted to not be courteous, tempted to criticize. This all comes from stress. Whenever you got things to do and you have a lot to produce and you have an important position, you've got pressure on you. And so he notices this by saying, I'm going to make that my second rule to not let the pressure get to me. I think in today's language, we would say something a little bit simpler. We'd say, never let them see you sweat, right? I'm not going to let them see me sweat. I'm going to show the very best that I can, but to do that, I have to resolve to do that, right? Third rule, only for today, I will be happy in the certainty that I was created to be happy, not only in the other world, but also in this one. What a resolution, right? So he's kind of like the first one where he says, I will live this whole day positively, the third rule that he gives for himself, I will be happy in this world. Now, of course, that shows you like what, what that means. I'm going to choose to be happy, choose to enjoy the good things of life. Not, not to an excess, right? Not too much, etc. Not making our home here. But at the same time, what a resolution. And I think we miss this a lot. Some of us are so impassioned by drive that we're addicted to work. Let's just be honest with you. If you're addicted to work, you're, you're missing something that's spiritual. You're missing an as aspect of your life that is higher than work, which is the leisure that we're called to live. Now, by leisure, I don't mean an absence of, of work only. I mean the presence of a really deep ability to enjoy, not just material things or sensible things, but to live the greatest and deepest things well, we, we should have our home, not just at our desk, but in the situations that the workplace and that our desk produces for us, reading, prayer, beauty, deep relationships, quality time, right? And a lot of us miss that. And, and then we say that we're happy, but actually we're not because all, all that we know how to do is constantly run to the next thing instead of being able to, to sit back and say, I, was, I work to live. I don't live to work. 
right? So to do that though, you have to make a resolution like he did. I, only for today, I will be happy in this world as well as in the next one, right? So obviously you could take us too far, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something more fundamental. My goodness, if you're married, do you take the time to enjoy that relationship every day? How can I, how can I show love, shower the people that we love with love, as James Taylor would say, right? Show them the way that we feel. Well, that's, that's this type of, of, of resolution and practice. How can I celebrate the victories that we have at work? Make my relationships with my colleagues really meaningful. Well, seeking to do that, according to Pope John XXIII, the saint, is a pathway of a saint. The fourth rule, only for today, I will adapt to circumstances without requiring all circumstances to be adapted to me. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That I was thinking about this one because this is something that happens to us all the time. We, we, we got pressure on us. We're trying to deliver. We've got all kinds of things to do and technology issues hit, right? And you say, oh my gosh. And then usually we, we fall into fits of anger or whatever into despair in the end, you know, because it's just like this technology gets in our way. And then you've got to take two steps back or three steps back just to take one half step forward. And that's greatly frustrating, right? Or, or people that don't deliver the goods that they were supposed to deliver to you or, or things that happen in your family life or waking up with a bad cold the day of a board meeting. Right? All these different things, which are the circumstances of our lives. Here, the, this great saint is saying to us, today, I will adapt to them. Right? It doesn't mean that you just, you just quit, but he's, he's saying, like, I'm going to see in circumstances God's sealed orders. Right? That's an old saying. Right? It means that, that God is governing my day as well. And so I don't just let myself get pushed willy-nilly, but I do allow myself humbly to say that I need to accomplish a mission that might be deeper, that might be bigger than what I think I've listed down on my to-do list for the day, right? So to do that, I have to resolve. I'm not gonna require all my circumstances to be adapted to my own wishes. I'm going to instead adapt to some of them. So if the air conditioning goes out, well, maybe there's just something I need to learn from that, right? There, I think there's a wisdom here. Because now you're letting into your day with this type of rule, you're letting God really influence what you do. You're giving him a role. It's not just that everything that hurts you is bad. <laughs> Maybe things that are pushing you in a different direction or, or taking you where you'd rather not go are actually from God. And, and he's teaching you something with it. The fifth rule, only for today, I will devote 10 minutes of my time to some good reading. Remembering that just as food is necessary to the life of the body, so good reading is necessary to the life of the soul. I want to just meditate on this for a second with you because this is so important. Uh, St. Augustine uses a Latin term uh, to speak about the inner kind of soup that is inside of a person out of which we draw the words and the decisions that make up the majority of our day. That inner soup, he calls it the memoria, like memory, the memoria. And it's this, it's this faculty or this place in the soul that we need to tend. Because when people come and see you, what do you talk about? When, when you have to make a split decision, which way do you go? How do you react to things? These are all going to be fed by what you're reading, what you're watching, what you're listening to. And, and that, that inner soup for a Christian, it should be full of Christ. And to do that, we need to, fill, we need to feed it. We need to fill it with positivity, especially Christian thought. And so you don't have to be exclusively this way, but look what he says, 10 minutes. 10 minutes a day of good reading, right? Then you can check the news and everything else. But what a habit to put into our, our daily regime. If I'm going to act like a Christian, I need to feed myself like one. Feed my soul by good reading. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. I hope you're enjoying these, these 10 rules from John the 23rd, right, who, who is a saint, right, is a pope and a saint. So he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. 
And he carried that weight with all the decisions, all the politics, all of the vicissitudes that could happen. And, and how did he carry it? If we look concretely, just like the rest of us, he needed to have some discipline. So his discipline was to write these rules down, to look at them every morning, to remind him of how he was going to live this day. Now, so take a look at rule six for, this is a powerful one. Rule six, only for today, I will do one good deed and not tell anyone about it. <laughs> Isn't that neat? We say practice random acts of kindness. Well, he was doing more than random. He was actually saying, let's do, let's choose each day one good deed. I think it's neat because if you were to look over your day, I think most of us would be tempted to say, okay, yeah, I do good things all the time. I'm a really good person. I'm like, okay, why don't you tell me about them? <laughs> Could you list for me the five good things that you did in one day for other people? It'd be kind of interesting. Because I think a lot of us would be challenged to do it. We, we're just not a, really aware of being intentional about it. Well, then how many things do you do every day that, you're, that you're, if you're not intentional, you actually accomplish? Can you lose weight by not being intentional about it? <laughs> I mean, can you build muscle by not? I mean, can, how can you be good if you're not intentional about doing at least one good thing and not telling anybody about it? Just doing a, a, a good deed every day. You should be able to write it down at the end of the day and to, to get into the habit of doing it. Rule number seven, only for today, I will do at least one thing I do not like doing. And if my feelings are hurt, I will make sure that no one notices. What a beautiful sentiment that is. So many people today, because we live in a world that really values the, the importance of emotional expression, well, they end up becoming kind of like drama kings or drama queens, right? And everybody knows everything that, that I'm feeling at every time. And that can be really heavy on the people around us. I think it actually can really weaken our ability to lead. If, remember, like I said before, never let them see you sweat. Well, if people are seeing you sweat, you're, you're not going to be able to say that you're bigger than the situation in front of you. And, and here he's saying that if my feelings get hurt this day, I'm going to make sure no one notices. I mean, obviously there was good psychological health that she had to take care of, but at the same time, it's like not to make ourselves the center of everything. <laughs> when we do that, we make everybody else make us the center as well. And it's really, it can be very de detrimental to our ability to lead them, right? And I will do one thing that I do not like doing. So you do one good deed and you do one thing that you'd rather not do just to make you grow. Isn't that amazing? What a great perspective from a saint. He's saying like you need to stretch every day, not just your body, but also your soul. One good thing that I do not like doing. Rule number eight, only for today, I will make a plan for myself. I may not follow it to the letter, but I will make it. And I will be on guard against two evils, hastiness and indecision. Right? Hastiness, go making too many decisions too fast, and indecision, holding myself back from moving forward. What's he saying with this? Isn't it amazing to hear a saint talking about being efficient? <laughs> I point this out because a lot of folks today walk around thinking, oh no, the saints were just playing with animals in the forest, you know, and I don't sit, you know, praying without a care in the world. And here you have a saint that's like, I'm going to make a plan for my day. So I don't know how he did it. I suppose he would just map it out by the hour, but he would map it out, meaning I need to get stuff done today, but I will do it with a plan. We all are different. Some of us do this in our minds, but it's, it, I think it's very reassuring to see that even a saint needed to plan out what he was going to do, saying on the one hand, I'm going to be careful not to throw myself at it. And on the other hand, I got to make sure I get stuff done. Right? And rule number nine, only for today, I will firmly believe despite appearances the, that the good providence of God cares for me as no one else who exists in this world. Wow. Notice how he stresses, I will firmly believe. What a, what a line to ingrain in the very fabric of his day. Don't we all need this? I, I think that most Christians, the biggest problem we have doesn't come from the outside, from foes or forces aligned against us. It comes from the inside. We have a hard time really believing in the love that God has for us. And, and here we go. All the way back here is 1960. You have a Pope who's saying the same thing. I will firmly believe that God loves me in a totally unique and wonderful way. And notice he also says, despite all appearances. So in my mind, I might say, he can't love me because of this. He can't love me because of that. And the Pope's like, no, I'm going to believe firmly that he loves me today. 
<laughs> now, you got to think what, what upshot that, that has on a person's life. As soon as you believe that God loves you, you will love him back. And you'll love him back effectively. Boy, to, to know that God loves us frees our soul to dare great things for Christ. It, it, and so without that love, we can't do anything. That's why it's so important to see the Pope fighting for this uh, and putting this down. Today, I will firmly believe that God will take care of me like he'll do no one else in the world. Not that he doesn't care for anyone else, but that he does to me in a unique and special way. And then finally, only for today, I will have no fears. In particular, I will not be afraid to enjoy what is beautiful and to believe in goodness. Isn't it remarkable that a third of his daily rules had to do with positivity, I, choosing to look at the good side of life? So he must have had a, a powerful personality that was leading him against that. And yet he fought to believe in what is beautiful, to believe in goodness, enjoy what is beautiful. I mean, I will have no fears, he says. So I will take upon myself the perspective that God is in control of this world, in other words, and that in, in the end, it's going to work out. What does that give him? Leadership. People will follow those who believe in the victory and see a place to it. And if we're not leading our people into victory, what are we leading them into? I think this is an amazing lesson for all of us to begin our day like this saint did, to take these practical steps, believing in goodness, believing in our right to enjoy it, believing in God's love for us so that then we discipline ourselves as, as we work in this world and we dedicate ourselves to stretching doing what is good in a measurable way, making out a plan so that in the end, we can really be the disciples of Christ that he's called us to be, the leaders of his world in positivity and in truth. And so may John the 23rd pray for all of us. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at communications at stjohninstitute.org. That's communications at stjohninstitute.org. And visit www.stjohninstitute.org and sign up for our newsletter to receive updates from Father Nathan.